The largest civil works project in American history stretches 3,787 miles across seven states, and most people have never heard of it. This network of levees, floodways, and control structures has prevented $1.27 trillion in flood damages since 1928, shields 4.5 million people from catastrophic flooding, and fights an ongoing engineering battle against a river that geologists say is overdue to abandon its current path entirely. $80 comes back for every dollar invested in this system. A single structure in Louisiana stands between New Orleans and complete disaster. Because if that structure fails, both New Orleans and Baton Rouge would find themselves stranded on a saltwater estuary, with economic consequences that would ripple across the entire globe. But understanding why America built something this massive means going back to the spring of 1927, to the worst river disaster the country has ever seen. Late August of 1926 brought heavy rains that simply refused to stop. January 1, 1927 marked the earliest date on record that the Mississippi broke flood stage at Cairo, Illinois, and what followed over the next several months would reshape American infrastructure policy forever. Between April and May of 1927, peak flooding turned 27,000 square miles across 11 states into an inland sea. Near Vicksburg, the Mississippi stretched 80 miles wide. The waters refused to recede until August. The death toll tells only part of the story. Red Cross officials recorded 246 fatalities. The Weather Bureau estimated 500, and some disaster experts put the true number above 1,000. Displaced families numbered between 700,000 and 750,000, with rescue teams pulling 330,000 people from rooftops, trees, and levee tops. Property damage ran somewhere between $246 million and $1 billion in 1927 currency, which represented roughly one-third of the entire federal budget that year. Adjusted for full economic impact in modern terms, that translates to between $1.38 and $1.48 trillion. At least 145 levees broke during those months. The catastrophic failure came at 8-2 in the morning on April 21, 1927, when the Mounds Landing Levee in Mississippi gave way and quickly expanded into a three-quarter mile gap. Water over 100 feet deep at the breach flooded nearly 2,000 square miles, making it the worst levee break in United States history. And here's the thing about how this happened. Back in 1885, the Mississippi River Commission had adopted what engineers called the levees only approach. The theory held that confining the river between walls would increase pressure and scour the channel deeper, naturally expanding capacity over time. Year after year, crews built the levees higher, from one and a half feet at College Point, Louisiana in 1850, to over 20 feet by the mid-1920s. The Army Corps went public in 1926 with a declaration that the levees stood strong enough to prevent any future flooding. What happened in 1927 proved that confidence catastrophically misplaced. National outrage demanded immediate change. President Calvin Coolidge signed the Flood Control Act of 1928 into law on May 15th of that year, authorizing the largest public works appropriation the country had ever seen, exceeding even the Panama Canal's $310 million construction cost. Gone was the failed levees-only approach. The new plan called for four major elements working together, higher levees, floodways capable of diverting excess water, channel improvement and stabilization, and tributary basin improvements including dams, reservoirs, and pumping stations. The 1928 Act established something else that mattered just as much. Federal responsibility for flood control replaced the old system where states and localities bore most costs. Congress recognized that local communities had already contributed approximately $292 million and waived further monetary requirements, asking only for rights of way and post-construction maintenance. The Mississippi River and Tributaries Project had arrived. Today, the MRNT project shields a 36,000 square mile area covering Arkansas, Illinois, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, and Tennessee. The numbers border on incomprehensible. The levee system alone accounts for 3,787 authorized miles of embankments and flood walls, with roughly 2,216 miles running along the main stem of the Mississippi. By 2019, 
construction had completed 3,486 miles. These bear no resemblance to the modest levees of the 1920s. A typical mainline levee today rises 30 feet tall and packs 907,000 cubic yards of material per mile, compared to 22 feet and 421,000 cubic yards back in 1927. Four major floodways serve as pressure relief valves capable of diverting massive water volumes away from the main channel. Missouri's Birds Point New Madrid floodway handles 550,000 cubic feet per second. Louisiana's Morganza floodway manages 600,000. The West Atchafalaya takes 250,000. The Bonnet Carré Spillway near New Orleans handles another 250,000. Engineers designed the entire system to handle what they call the Project Design Flood, measuring 2,360,000 cubic feet per second at Cairo, Illinois, with a maximum of 1,250,000 cubic feet per second flowing past New Orleans. Cumulative federal spending reached $15.9 billion through 2019, bringing the project to approximately 89% completion. That $1.27 trillion in prevented flood damages represents an 80 to 1 return on investment. The most striking statistic involves what hasn't happened. No project levy built to MR&T standards has ever failed, not in the major floods of 1937, 1945, 1950, 1973, 2011, or any year since authorization. The 1929 flood marked the first time all mainline levees held after MR&T construction began. Levees and floodways tell only part of the story. The most critical and precarious piece of infrastructure sits in a remote Louisiana location called the Old River Control Structure, which may well be the single most important flood control facility in America. What the Mississippi River wants to do explains everything about why this structure matters. About 300 miles upstream from New Orleans, the Atchafalaya River branches off toward the Gulf of Mexico on a path the Mississippi finds far more attractive. The Atchafalaya route runs 140 to 190 miles shorter to the Gulf, with a gradient more than twice as steep. The elevation difference between the two riverbeds measures 17 to 19 feet at typical flows. Rivers seek the path of least resistance, and between 1850 and 1950, the Atchafalaya's share of Mississippi flow climbed from less than 10% to about 30%. Corps of Engineers' analysis in 1953 concluded that without intervention, the Mississippi would completely abandon its current course for the Atchafalaya by 1990. The consequences of that shift would be staggering. New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and the entire industrial corridor between them, home to 110 petrochemical plants refining 13% of the nation's gasoline, would end up stranded on a saltwater estuary. The Port of New Orleans estimates Mississippi River closure would cost $295 million per day. Barges carrying 60% of U.S. grain exports would have nowhere to go. Saltwater could penetrate 230 miles upriver. Congress authorized the Old River Control Structure in 1954 to prevent exactly that outcome. The complex maintains a 70-30 flow split, with 70% continuing down the Mississippi and 30% diverting to the Atchafalaya. That ratio, based on 1950 conditions, remains congressionally mandated to this day. Four structures make up the complex. The low sill structure, finished in 1963, stretches 566 feet long, with 11 massive vertical lift steel gates, each one 44 feet wide, founded on over 1,900 steel H piles driven as deep as 116 feet. The overbank structure manages major flood flows. The auxiliary structure, completed in 1986, added six more gates. The Sidney A. Murray Jr. Hydroelectric Station, finished in 1990, generates 192 megawatts of power. Combined capacity reaches approximately 140,000 cubic feet per second. The old river control structure faced its most severe test in 1973, and it came within a hair of total failure. April 14, 1973, brought terror to the low sill structure foreman, who watched a 67-foot-long wing wall collapse while the structure handled 2 million cubic feet per second. One account described the force as six Niagara Falls worth of water hammering through for nearly three months. A scour hole the size of a football field opened up, dropping over 50 feet deep and exposing 50 feet of the 90-foot foundation piles. 
The upstream and downstream scour holes crept within 150 feet of merging together. Had they connected, the entire structure would have collapsed and the Mississippi would have changed course right then and there. Engineers discovered the full extent of the damage by drilling a hole through the structure and lowering a camera. What appeared on screen, according to one account, showed fish swimming where there should have been solid earth. Major General Charles C. Noble ordered the Morganza Spillway open for the first time in its history on April 16th. Louisiana's governor called to ask if he had authority to prevent the opening, and Noble's answer cut straight to the point. The river, he said, didn't give him five days' notice. Every available rock on the river was commandeered, and crews dumped boulders continuously into the scour holes while the Bonnet Carré spillway operated for a record 75 days. The structure survived, but just barely. Low sill capacity dropped to 60% of the original design and has never recovered. That near failure led directly to construction of the auxiliary structure in 1986, at a cost of $206 million, which translates to about $480 million in 2019 dollars. Writer John McPhee visited Old River and captured the fragility of the whole arrangement. From thousands of feet in the air, he wrote, the structures appear temporary, fragile, vastly outmatched by the natural world, like a lesion in the side of the Mississippi butterflied with surgical tape. Everything built over eight decades faced its ultimate examination in 2011, when levees, floodways, and control structures all operated under extreme stress simultaneously. Records shattered across the entire system. Cairo reached 61.72 feet, two feet above the 1937 record. Vicksburg saw 2,272,000 cubic feet per second at crest. Red River Landing hit 63.39 feet on May 18, six feet higher than the 1973 crest and the all-time record. All three major floodways operated at the same time for the first time in history. The night of May 2, 2011 brought explosive charges to the Birds Point New Madrid floodway, breaching it for the first time in 74 years. Three detonations flooded 130,000 acres of farmland to save Cairo from destruction. May 14th saw Morganza open for only the second time ever, eventually reaching 17 open bays, diverting 172,000 cubic feet per second and flooding 4,600 square miles. Bonnet Carré opened on May 9th, eventually reaching 330 of its 350 bays, diverting 316,000 cubic feet per second over 42 days. The system held. Protection extended to 4.1 million people, and prevented flooding across 10 million acres. Estimates of prevented damages range between $108 and $234 billion. 20 people lost their lives, and actual damages exceeded $3 billion. But without the system, the catastrophe would have measured orders of magnitude worse. Geologists point out that the Mississippi is overdue for an avulsion, a complete change of course. The last major shift occurred approximately 1,000 years ago and the river typically changes course every thousand to 1,500 years. Engineers testifying before Congress in 1928 put it bluntly. The river, they said, is just itching to go that way. Every passing year sees the Atchafalaya grow deeper while the Mississippi builds its bed higher with sediment. The 2011 and 2019 floods set the two highest records ever measured at the old river control structure. For many engineers, the question isn't if the river eventually wins, but when. Leroy Dugas, who managed old river operations starting in 1963, put it plainly, whenever you try to control nature, you've got one strike against you. Mother nature is patient, he added, and mother nature has more time than we do. John McPhee captured the standoff in memorable terms. The Atchafalaya lies there like a big alligator in a low slough, with time on its side, waiting to outweigh the Corps of Engineers hunkering down ever lower in its bed and presenting a sort of maw to the Mississippi into which the river could fall. New challenges test the system constantly. December 2018 through February 2019 brought the wettest meteorological winter on record. The 2019 flood kept water above flood stage at Red River Landing for 226 days straight, from late December through August, sending nearly 210 trillion gallons downstream, 64% more than the 10-year average. Bonnet Carré opened twice in a single year for the first time ever in 2019. 
then opened again in 2020. Marking the first time in history, the spillway operated three consecutive years. Unintended consequences from the levee system have mounted as well. Coastal Louisiana has lost between 1,900 and 2,000 square miles since the 1930s, an area matching Delaware in size. A football field of wetlands vanishes every hundred minutes. The sediment that built Louisiana's coast over millennia now falls into the deep gulf instead, blocked from the delta by the very levees protecting everything upstream. The irony cuts deep. The only places on Louisiana's coast actually gaining land are the Wax Lake Delta and Atchafalaya Delta, both created by outlet diversions that the control structures were specifically built to limit. Mark Twain once declared that 10,000 river commissions with the minds of the world at their back cannot tame that lawless stream, cannot curb it or define it, cannot say to it, go here or go there, and make it obey. For nearly a century now, the Mississippi River and Tributaries Project has pushed back against Twain's certainty. Every major flood since 1928 has met a system that held firm. $80 returned for every dollar invested. Millions of people protected. Trillions of dollars in economic activity secured. Engineers who built this system and those maintaining it today harbor no illusions about what they're up against. The river moves slowly, but it never stops. Given enough time, rivers usually win. The old river control structure stands as humanity's answer, temporary on a geological timescale perhaps, but extraordinary in its ambition. One Tulane Law professor summed up the stakes this way. The greatest arrogance, he said, was the stealing of the sun. The second greatest arrogance is running rivers backward. The third greatest arrogance is trying to hold the Mississippi in place. America built that arrogance in concrete and steel. So far, it has held. How long it continues holding is a question engineers and the river will answer together, one flood season at a time. If this video taught you something new about the engineering keeping the Mississippi in place, hit that subscribe button and leave a comment below telling us what surprised you most. We cover stories like this every week, exploring the massive infrastructure projects that most people never think about, but that shape our world in ways that matter.